Welcome to this Next Generation of Parks lecture event. My name is Tom Evers. I'm the Executive Director with the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. And we're really thrilled to have you all join us tonight for this very special program. And I do look forward to a time when we can come together in person uh, for these events, we're, uh, but we're still so grateful that we can hold these important discussions virtually and have incredibly talented, thoughtful people as part of the event series. And, uh, and we, it, it also allows us to extend the reach to folks across the country um, so many more can participate. I want to thank first off our presenting sponsor, our Bar Engineering, who is sponsoring the, the Next Gen series this year for the 2021-2022 series. Thank you. Uh, and to the many donors who contribute in so many ways to this work of the Parks Foundation, including our board, staff, the incredible community of volunteers and leaders who we work alongside. Thank you all for uh, allowing us to do this work. The Minneapolis Parks Foundation is an independent nonprofit with a mission to transform lives through parks and the public realm by aligning community vision and philanthropic investment. We work closely with our public partners, especially the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, to bring to life vibrant, healthy, and aspirational park system here in Minneapolis that serves everyone and to share those lessons beyond our city. The Parks Foundation can help bring forth new ideas for the Minneapolis Park System in partnership with the community. Uh, just in the past year, since our last Next Generation of Park event, uh, we have celebrated the opening of three new spaces in the Minneapolis Park System on the riverfront here in Minneapolis. Uh, Waterworks in the Central Riverfront, the River Overlook at 26th Avenue North, and a new nature play area at the North Mississippi Regional Park, which was a gift from pe uh, People for Parks. If you haven't visited them, we'd welcome a chance to have you discover them. You can learn more on our website, www.mplsparksfoundation.org. Uh, through the People's for Parks Fund, we continue to support community-driven programs, and we're working closely with community and the Park Board to continue to build on past successes. We are also local convener of Reimagining Civic Commons, and I believe we have folks around the country, country joining us from that national network which is uh, a network of civic leaders innovating new and better ways to design, operate, manage public spaces in order to deliver social, economic, and environmental benefits for our communities. And finally, we event produce events like this, the next generation of parks, uh, also our walk and talks to inspire people to learn together, and also the upcoming poster for park shows uh, beginning on October 23rd. It's great to have people from everywhere joining us. Um, it's an honor to have you with us. And I just wanna take a note that wherever you are joining us from, it's a certainty that like us here in Minnesota, you too are on land that was stolen, that was home to one of the great indigenous nations who call this continent home long before colonists arrive. Even though we're virtual, it is important that we recognize that. In Minneapolis, where I stand, this land is home, was home, is home, will be home to the Dakota, the Anishinaabe people, among many others. Um, and it's also important to notice that we're home to a tapestry of new Americans who are bringing with them rich traditions uh, from their ancestors to our community. We hold the responsibility to acknowledge our past harms and strive toward healing together. Um, we are in a moment of change in America and in Minneapolis, and as we struggle to reconcile our past, present, and future, um, any words we choose, I choose to describe this moment will fall short of the complexity and the promise in front of us. And that's why I'm really grateful about what we're talking about tonight. Um, our guests are bringing a wealth of information and knowledge and thoughtfulness. Each of them are working in the community, with the community, and for the community to provoke and evoke necessary change. Um, our topic tonight is race, place, and representation. And it is uh, with my honor to introduce Kofi Boone, whose work as our, our speaker joining the group. Uh, Kofi Boone's work is in the overlap between landscape architect and the environmental justice with specializations in democratic design, digital media, media, and interpreting cultural landscapes. Kofi's teaching and professional work have earned awards, including student and professional ASL, ASLA awards. He serves on the board of directors of the CORE Network, the Black Land Loss Prevention Project, as well as the Landscape Architect Foundation, where he is the president-elect. Kofi serves on the advisory board of the Black Landscape Architects Network, and he has published uh, work broadly in peer review as well as popular media. We're so thrilled to have him with us today. 
I'm also excited to have join us Tabitha Montgomery. Tabitha is, uh, is the executive director of the Powderhorn Neighborhood Association, PPNA, where she and the staff proactively look for creative ways to advance its advocacies, events, and programs in the community. She has spent more than 20 years tapping into her gifts as a management communications and visioning to serve a wide array of people, businesses, and organizations. And then lastly, I'm thrilled to have our host of the conversation, Paul Bachnight. Paul is the project implementation director for the Minneapolis Parks Foundation. He leads the foundation's physical projects and outreach to communities and public institution, institutions. Paul's an architect, an urban designer, a design activist, a community leader, working in the community based design and development for over 30 years. His work is throughout the city of Minneapolis and beyond. He's passionately committed to working at the intersection of social, cultural, economic, and spatial systems, creating solutions that are equitably steeped in place and benefit the community. All three of our guests tonight are rooted deeply in community work and are caring stewards of the community-driven aspirations. And I'm so thrilled to have them come to talk with us tonight and let us listen in on their conversation. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Tom. Oh, absolutely. I'm so thrilled to have you all with us. Um, Paul, are you, uh, um, oh, before you take it away, I just want to make a couple notes here. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over and, and step back on this. Um, folks we're, can submit questions. Uh, I believe you can, uh, to, uh, there's a question, a Q&A button at the bottom. You can submit it um, and later on. We'll be talking, that'll be added to the discussion. Um, we're recording this and posting it uh, to our website, and we're streaming live via Facebook, so feel free to share it out with folks, and it'll run till about eight o'clock. Um, Kofi, Tabitha, Paul, thank you for joining us for this evening. Paul, you ready? You got it? Excellent. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Tom, for that uh, great in introduction, and uh, Tabitha and Kofi, it's great to be with you, even though it's only via Zoom, and hopefully soon that that won't be the case, and we can get together and enjoy a conversation in person. So tonight we're going to talk about race, place, and representation, um, and really the dichotomy between the fact that you know we believe we we aspire that all of our public spaces, parks, etc., connect us all. Uh, they're inclusive. They're welcoming. They're equitable. But we know that the reality of that is not always the case, and that the systems and institutions that create, program, support, and maintain these spaces, you know, are founded in racism. You know, an example of that is, you know, Seneca Village was displaced to develop Central Park. So, so tonight we want to, you know, dive into that tension, that dichotomy, talk about how do we, how do we solve that. Before we do that, though, just give uh, Tabitha and Kofi a little bit to talk a little bit more about themselves, um, but particularly from the why do you do this work? What, what is your why? So people get to know like what, what drives you in doing this work. And so I'm going to start with Tabitha. Um, wow, that's a big question. I, you know, Paul, and I almost want to say it's not even fair, but I'm going to do my best. You know, I think that sometimes <laughs> in many ways ebbs and flows in terms of my why. I think uh, what grounds me in this idea of serving community, serving people, um, believing that um, what things the community needs to be whole or healthy at any particular given point is something that I have a purpose around doing. Meaning I believe personally that I've been called to this work. Um, and for me, from a person of faith that is part of kind of who I am and connected to how I see the my worldview in many ways, it's purpose. Um, some, some of that means, I don't know if I really had a choice as much as my path always probably was gonna put me here, put me in a place of attempting to serve people and systems and process um, in the intent that those systems and processes uh, get as close as possible um, to treating um, most people, if not all people equitably. And the truth of that statement is I'm even humbled by the fact that I might not see it um, in my tenure, in my journey, in my time on this earth. Um, but I do believe that that doesn't discount the work that I still have been called to do. And so some of it, it, it feels like a siren for me at times to try to, to be a deep listener 
um, and a deep servant of what could be. Okay, thank you, Kofi. Yeah, uh, thank you, Paul. And uh, uh, what up, though, to tap of a, a fellow Detroiter, and a Detroiter. Kofi, <laughs> 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 listen. <laughs> Kofi, you know it's I, don't go there. It's going I don't there. need a lot of encouragement. So. It's, it's going there today. Right? Now that I learned how to say dog, I'm good, right? <laughs> You're getting there. That's right. uh, I, I appreciate it. It is, a, it is a challenging question. I would say for me, it starts with family. Uh, you know, I'm reflecting now on uh, my great-great-grandfather was a buffalo soldier. Uh, and he was integral to my grandfather's life, who was a self-taught artist. Uh, John Robinson, who was too poor to go to college. Uh, and uh, in Washington, D.C. and Anacostia, uh, originally from Georgetown, but when it was a Black community, which some people don't know, uh, displaced to Anacostia in Southeast and it was all rural. Uh, but his passion in, uh, uh, for creating uh, to the point where, you know, there's a folk story in my family about uh, him uh, rummaging through the trash outside of the art school at Howard University in Washington, D.C. to find used art supplies and then sitting outside the window outside, pantomiming the moves of the students in the class to learn the techniques uh, for doing it. So uh, I feel like me being in an institution now that he was unable to attend uh, and his entire generation was excluded from is, is, is a part of the academic part. But, but to be real about it, uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a professional musician. Uh, and I went to a school called Interlock and Arts Academy. It's in Northern Michigan near Travis City. And I was right on that track, uh, but discovered while I was there, uh, the beauty of the outdoors, that there were professions and tracks associated with ecology and the natural environment and learning about the, the healing effects that those places have and had never heard of landscape architecture in high school and was fortunate enough to have people encourage me to make that connection. So I was able to bring an understanding of growing up in Detroit in terms of culture and community and city and also the value of what we do. And in the academy, the value of instilling those values and those best practices to the next generation. So best practices to inform our entire profession, passing those on to our next generation of designers, to our students and serving communities. So. It's sort of a full circle thing for me that led me here. All right, T, I knew you two could handle that question right off the bat. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, both of you talked about community, family. Um, so, you know, I wanna talk a little bit more about place. So so we know place is important, you know, from a, from a physical standpoint, but really you talked, both of you talked about other attributes of place. And so, so I really kind of like to go there and, and kind of ask you to define place and really those attributes and values that you think are important. And since I started with Tabitha, Kofi, I'm gonna start with you this time on that. All right, that sounds good. Um, so uh, the way we talk about place as opposed to space is that it's infused with meaning, it's infused with perception and places are connected to community in unique ways, right? So we put value on them, right, collectively, and we engage with them based on those particular values. Uh, in the United States, it's almost impossible to talk about that without talking about race. And, you know, that's an important signifier uh, as a part of, we deal with this. Uh, but I do want to offer sort of a nuance to how we talk about race that gets back to the notion of place. So uh, race, as an idea that there's something in our DNA that makes us superior, inferior is a complete myth, but it's extremely real, right? It's a myth that's reinforced by policy, reinforced by systems, and that public spaces are no different from that. Uh, race, in a lot of ways, was established as a way to justify a caste system. Uh, so when we talk about race and we talk about Black, Black, in my opinion, is a culture or a series of cultures ways of doing, ways of practicing. Uh, and in the American context, it was under extreme duress and oppression, right? Bringing forth cultural practices from wherever we came from, uh, an African continent, attempting to sustain those, but also resistance, cultures of resistance, making boundaries and spaces where we can continue to practice those liberation and those freedom acts from feeding ourselves to celebrating and ritual to uh, conveying relationships to one another. So, the cultural practice of space 
uh, within the context of race in America is I think more precisely where I spend a lot of my time is to get to that point of the rituals that are required for us to feel free and liberated as black people in black communities happening in public space, the ability to do that and the, the conflicts that come from when we try to do that, of which of course Minneapolis is, is, is uh, understands that. Yeah, um, so I love that, you know, that, that differentiation talking about culture. Um, so, um, Keeping that in mind, Tabitha, you know, how are you thinking about this question? You know, I think I'm kind of right there with Kofi and the way that I, maybe I would say it slightly differently or an add to it is that, you know what, I think place has a sneaky way of having a visceral impact on you and you don't even know it. Place really, as opposed to space, a place is something that you can kind of come to mind because of a smell or a sound. Like even right now for the audience who's listening in, the way that my brother greeted me, Kofi, with what up though, is like Detroit language and slang. And it was almost like I could hear the street light flicker on my block of 17300 press back home. And that's how place comes to be so important and, and essential that you as people, as us, as individuals, never us make an assumption about what would be better for a place of people, um, mm -hmm. which then speaks to race, because sometimes we have the uh, innate ability to believe that place looks a particular way. Mm -hmm. Success of a place, beauty of a place, landscape mm -hmm. and or buildings should be a certain place, when really place for people have been so defined and wedded to their day-to-day -day experience that might look like that uh, beat up playground that you know, those boys who are playing there might feel as if the weeds growing through the cracks help them to get a better jump off when they about to go to the hole. So some of it is really a, important for us to understand that over time, people kind of become wedded, connected, rooted in place. And that the disruption of that oftentimes is done easily when people think the place that you have should always be better, which is often speak, speaks to how people see um, what looks like for anyone to aspire to a bigger home or a better neighborhood, right? And so I think that's what comes up for me in place. Right now in the Potterhorn community that I serve, even last year, there were so many things, right? That I won't go down the road that, that happened, but there was the difference response for people who were connected to Potterhorn Park, this 66 acre jewel in the heart of our community when residents who were experiencing homelessness began to occupy it and how they then saw space and place because it was a part of their day-to-day -day ability to use that property, that, that land um, a particular way versus how people who are holding down George Floyd Square sees that you know, space and that place. And some on the outside looking in, me included, believe that we can do better um, not only now, but in the future in terms of how to hold Mr. Floyd's memory um, and legacy. Um, but right now, if you were to go to the corner of 38th and Chicago and ask some of those folks, could this be better? Should it be better? I would not be shocked at one iota if they said 100% not. Absolutely don't touch a thing because it was um, birthed and moved organically through community. And so to touch it is risky because then you're questioning someone's vision of good. You're questioning somebody's vision of what, you know, place means to them. So it's deep, but sometimes we have the, um, the sometimes the uh, instinct to create homogeny out of place for all people. Yeah, um, and you know, Kofi, you and I know that as designers that, you know, that drive to, 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 you know, disregard culture in place and to make it homogenous as, as Tabitha was just, just talking about. And actually, Kofi, when you and I got introduced, it was, you know, when we did the, uh, the webinar about Black Landscapes Matter um, mm -hmm. and, and that whole discussion, um, which you two just really were talking about, about culture, about feeling, Tabitha talking about her block um, and, and what all that means. Um, so I'm going to kind of pivot from that a little bit, but Tabitha kind of teed it up and talk about, you know, the pandemic, you know, the murder of, of, of George Floyd and this global reckoning on race, you know, how is it, how, how is it really impacted your work? And I think Tabitha, you kind of hit it like, 
and and what do we need to do better? How how are we doing better? Like, what do you what do you two think? You know, what, and I'm gonna cut across like? the field, Paul, because I love it when you create a door, an opening, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna try to go deep in the end go, zone. Go go just go ahead and <laughs> go, go ahead. Up. <laughs> Man, put your money where your mouth is. I so appreciate the world and their proclamations and their resolutions about what we need to do better. But a couple of things for everybody that's listening. There is no need for us if we believe that racism or any ism is a public health crisis, fill in the blank, to be trying to eradicate or nullify it or pretend that it does not exist. It has a character. It has a nature. It comes from how we live, not only now, but in the past and how we will live in the future. So let's not put energy into that which does not warrant to try to completely eliminate. What we need to do is put our money where our mouth is. How about we fund what it means to really be able to support equity? So sometimes it's one thing to have a policy or a system or a structure that has been authored and documented and people support and potentially has become legislation. And then it's something else that then the budgetary process happens completely separate from the piece of legislation that we just passed. And so then it's never fully supported. And that happens even within private institutions, right? And so that's not just a municipal statement. That is a all we statement, right? So part of this work, part of this moment demands that we move beyond just the words of what we need to do and how important it is that we lift up BIPOC voices, how we create a place for BIPOC leaders or that we really address the ills in our communities and our societies about who we've left out and whose land we've stolen, all the things, the machinations. Our words become so pretty when we struggling, when we tired, when we want to do better. I mean, we are going to have some poets out of this thing. And yet you run it in 10 years and five years and you do the analysis and not much has shifted. And a lot of times that's because the budget never matched the propaganda. And so I don't need everybody to become wickedly woke or smart about what it means to be black in America. I don't need not one more documentary. What I do need is purse books and purse strings to be opened and actually fund the truth of what it means to have left out entire segments of this population's and structure systemic and struck in systematic ways for way too long all right um the, kofi you know can you could you go there after sister tabitha no nah, i can't follow that i'll put in just a little bit of two oh, cents there you go <laughs> No, no, that was that was fantastic. No, no, I, Paul, I'm just, go, go ahead and bring it. Go ahead and bring it. So, you know, one thing I do want to bring up is uh, part of this moment has made us reflect on cities in the past and how uh, pandemics in the past reshaped our cities. So some of the reasons why we have open spaces, connected linear parks, broad boulevards actually was in response to health crisis, um, even, you know, over a century ago. You know, and one of those seminal figures is Frederick Olmsted, who you mentioned, Paul, in the beginning, who, uh, along with Calvert Box, designed uh, Central Park and who displaced uh, Seneca Village. And to speak to uh, the sister's point, uh, Frederick Olmsted was an abolitionist. He wrote uh, incredibly uh, under a pen name uh, for articles in the New York Times, uh, what became the New York Times about his experience moving through the South, moving through uh, uh, enslaved uh, populations and, and plantations and wrote about those particular things was offered after his success with the Sanitation Commission uh, leadership of the Freedmen's Bureau, which he declined. Uh, however, uh, in his actions uh, as a landscape architect, uh, he could reconcile that with serial displacement. Seneca Village, Columbia Exhibition in Chicago and what happened with Jackson Park and actually self-built black communities that were there as well. And ingrained in our DNA in terms of landscape architects, as we revere that man, his 200th birthday is coming up next year. We have to reckon with that duality, right? That in the interest of pursuing these projects of which, yes, there are benefits, it was at the exclusion and actually at the detriment and the harm of those. And we, we have, been able to balance those professionally for a long period of time. This year, I agree with Tabitha that it shouldn't be the knee jerk, we gotta figure this out. But it is a reckoning in terms of how can we reconcile those two? And so, you know, a, a colleague of Olmsted was Cleveland, right? So Horace Cleveland is the designer of the Minneapolis Park System. They shared a lot of the same values. Uh, uh, you know, the question is, and I, you know, I just went to the website and saw, you know, uh, from Park Score that Minneapolis 
ranks as the third best park system in the country based on traditional criteria. But it has nothing to do with, say, Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation's uh, uh, life expectancy based on zip code. And if you live in North Minneapolis in what was formerly a red line community, that's 13 years of life expectancy less. Uh, and that's the aggregate of systemic problems. So I think there's, we can't solve all the problems through parks and open space, but we can start to use that as a way to model things that are more equitable. And so there are different types of equity uh, that we can talk about a little bit later. I think part of what uh, Sister Tabitha is talking about is procedural equity, which is to say how we make decisions, like who's in charge? How do we determine the allocation of resources? That's something that we have a lot of work to do. Uh, on not just in Minneapolis, but uh, across the country. Okay, um, so kind of following that trend, but um, I wanna pick up on something that Tabitha, you were talking about when we had our, our check-in the other day. And, and that was this, um, this idea about power and brand that you, that you brought up, you know, the other day. Um, and, you know, actually like, you know, I, I've thought about that a lot. Um, and the, this whole idea about, um, and you, you alluded to it too, like how we see places and, and the power of who's making the brand and what they should be. And that necessarily isn't about who's there or the culture that needs to be expressed. Um, and, and Kofi, you just kind of talked about the same thing when we think about Minneapolis as a brand and a progressive city, um, you know, number three park system, et cetera. But, you know, huge disparities, um, you know, in education between black and white people, wealth, et cetera. So kind of really where I wanted to go with that, and this is, you know, a little bit of an experiment is, I kind of wanted you guys to talk about that um, from, you know, this first from the city, both of you are from, from Detroit. Cause I think about this kind of Detroit brand we hear about now, which is all about, you know, downtown Quicken Loans, you know, <laughs> you know, all of that and still neighborhoods, you know, are, are struggling and what's going on. So I just thought, you know, once I learned that both of you are from Detroit, um, that, you know, having that conversation and then kind of segueing to talk a little bit about that in Minneapolis. So that's, that's where this, that's where this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what I will say is I just a little bit of a context setting for everyone who's, you know, listening in on our conversation is, I believe in the beauty, I just want to make some declarative statement so I'm not getting angry emails when you find me on LinkedIn. I believe in the beauty of the power of open spaces and the role, not only that parks, but that land and how we treat value, serve the land plays in the overall health and well-being of any individual. And one of the things that I was bringing up is that the way that our park system here in Minneapolis, and then I'll, I'm going to double back on things within Detroit, um, now as somewhat of an, an observer, but certainly as always what I believe is a, is a hometown girl, I'll speak to that in a moment, but the Minneapolis park system has been lauded, um, and in many ways, rightfully so, for the investments and the care and the diligence of its oversight and how it has shepherded these natural resources in service of community. Um, and for years, right, it has won awards. It has been either in the top one or top three, right? Um, in terms of how park systems are viewed in this nation. Um, and I think that that is powerly, powerfully seductive and has the tendency because of that macro narrative of excellence or high fidelity to cast a blanket ar around how all parks and all areas should be seen, treated and held in service of the people that are most adjacent to them. And I, and I think that sometimes a brand can be suffocating for the actual need of a particular place of people. Because I think that in the city of Minneapolis, right, there is always not only just the duality, but the dynamic nature of all of the priorities that any resident faces. And a lot of times in many BIPOC or heavily culturally diverse communities or low wealth diverse or low wealth communities or, or economically diverse communities, um, there are other things that are equally, if not more important than sometimes how we currently talk about and see public space, whether it be 
sustainability from a housing perspective so that you sometimes can't come to a meeting to weigh in on what should be in a park because you are more worried about whether or not you can pay your rent. And, and I don't mean that uh, just cavalierly, like right now there's any number of studies that speak to the housing crisis in our cities where it would suggest that there are really no vacancies, there are no rental vacancies, literally, I just looked at a report that um, can really support third persons who make 30% of area median income, right? So then that becomes really a problematic. And when you look at the, the, the reports in terms of some of the trajectory of our opioid crisis, in terms of the number of people we've lost from overdoses or nearly lost from overdoses. And I could go further into what I would call competing priorities within certain communities that often makes it um, nearly impossible to become um, enamored, right, with the brand of a park system like NPRB of which Minneapolis Parks Foundation serves. And that is no different, I think, I sometimes find across the country, across the nation, right, where there are things that are doing amazing things. And so in the city of Detroit, when you think about the downtown investments, right, I, I can't necessarily singularly disparage the idea of investing in downtown. What I generally take issue with in any particular city is when it becomes the tale of two cities and it's completely agnostic and separate from all the other truths and realities that exist. And so then what happens is the brand in the one area becomes what the city officials and or business leaders want to put forward as why you should come visit and everything else you don't need to talk about, address and or think about ways to support more seriously or deeply. And then that becomes this um, almost competitive tension within community pitting area against area when if we were to be more sober in how we prioritize how much investment could ever go into one area before you go back and say, but look at what, what areas we have not touched, right? And then that probably smacks eerily of regulation of which I probably support in any number of ways, right? Which sends people running. But the history of our country would suggest if we don't regulate ourselves, we do harm. When we think about what we are doing and our lackadaisical approach in many ways to supporting environmentally sustainable practices, um, where we don't regulate ourselves, then we put ourselves often in the position not to be able to respond like we uh, would like to, to the different needs in the different areas of any particular city, any particular town or geography. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, a lot, I agree with uh, what Tabitha was talking about. I'll add a few layers regarding Detroit. Uh, one is it's a legacy city. So in basis of comparison, it's difficult with Minneapolis in some ways. Uh, and I think one thing that has been positive is the work that's been done to not treat open and vacant land as uh, an indicator of loss or liability, but as an opportunity. Um, so we usually measure cities, wealth and capital and everything by density and occupation and that kind of thing by buildings but Detroit now is land rich, which enables it to do things that other cities can't do. Uh, I would also say that uh, there's an issue of readiness. Uh, and what is true across most American cities is that black people don't own a lot of land or property. Uh, we know that from the great migration from the South to the North, uh, just even in the 20th century alone, if you calculated all the rural land that was lost, its value today would be about a trillion dollars. You know, so the ability to leverage that wealth and that value to reinvest in community into infrastructure to pass along to the next generation to purchase and own property. There are no national studies of urban land ownership. But we know even in Detroit, the, the tragic irony is that most people who own vacant land in Detroit don't live there, even the state of Michigan, right? So this idea of real estate speculation that is preventing people from taking advantage of this abundant resource is a deal. So in that realm, we start to talk about the potential of what we call patient capital. So investors that are willing to wait, who don't need an immediate return on investment, who have a connection to local communities. And a neighborhood that I would lift up is the Fitzgerald neighborhood, which is near uh, University of Detroit Mercy. Uh, and through collaboration with the Detroit Collaborative Design Center and a number of other constituents have thought about 
you know, whenever we make an investment in public space, we know it's going to have an immediate uh, uh, impact on adjacent property values. We know that. How can we anticipate that and position the community to benefit from that as opposed to being displaced? And they worked creatively. They had some fits and starts, but they worked creatively to start to deal with some of the issues that Tabitha's talking about. Like, how do we set a real uh, price point for affordability for residents in this particular community? How do we make the emphasis having people stay in place so they can enjoy the benefits of this investment in public space, not necessarily get displaced because of those kind of factors? And it's been slow, it's been iterative, it's required a lot of partnerships, but there are parts of Detroit that are starting to do that. And it's really because they have this abundance of opportunity in terms of open land. And so I think that this idea of patient capital and partnerships that deal with the non-park sides of it, right? The private property components of it, the methods that people build education and build wealth, the readiness of those communities to really benefit from that and investment in that uh, is really important. And I think those are gonna be lessons that are gonna be transferred to other parts of the country. Okay, um, 7.37, so we've got a few more questions that we can go through. Um, so I'm going to try to pick because I got way too many for the time that we have. <laughs> um, but actually, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, Black Joy. So, so you know, in the, um, in the Black Space Manifesto, which is this <laughs> great document coming coming from the black urbanist collective that that talks about you know how do you design spaces where you know where you center you know the black experience whatever and and you know we are going through and and lots of you know parts of the country through trauma you know there's a lot of trauma in our communities and this summer um i had the chance to go to two events in parks um uh, one was a national night out at Weber Camden, because my wife is the executive director, and the other one was it was an event at North Commons um, with our partner Seeds of Harvest. And in both of those events, what was great was there were just just all of these black people having fun. You know, it it was joy, and it wasn't about the building. It wasn't about you know it it wasn't about that. It was it was kids doing you know. A potato sack races you know it, it was you know it was people doing a cha-cha slide so for my colleagues you missed that because you weren't there uh <laughs> but i was out there right <laughs> so um you know Alex. how we how we celebrate and catalyze and amplify you know black joy is really important you know in, in our community and and i think about this too you know it's worth thinking about design and not only that but what we do in parks, what we think we should do in parks, what we think we people say we shouldn't do in parks, you know, how do how do we how do we design these and do you know program these parks so that you know we can have that that radical black joy? Wow. I'm gonna ask you that, Kofi, because you know you're the designer. We're gonna start there. <laughs> well, job, I mean <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot of them. I think, you know, uh, first one is uh, getting a sense of the community where they feel safe and able to be free and be themselves. It's not sometimes in the places that we would say more mainstream practices direct us for those to occur. And it could be a street, it could be a corner, it could be a public park, it could be a lot of different places. And so I think, you know, the first part of that is getting a sense of where people feel like they can express themselves, you know, freely. Uh, so safety is not a police term. Safety is in terms of the perception of feeling like, yeah, I, I can do this. So you know, our analog here is Black August in the park, which happens in Durham Central Park, where the farmer's market is. And that's been unofficially anointed as the space where, where everybody's doing it. So I think that's an important part of it. I mean, I think with regard to programming, uh, I think it's important to also think about those other opportunities. So I'll take Black August in the park as an example, right? Uh, from the DJ that was performing to the people that were selling food, to the people that were running activities, to the people that were you know, maintaining the space and dealing with it, those were all local people who were all being paid and all being compensated. So in order to enable those activities to occur, the people that generated the program, like I'm old. So if I tried to do a program, even for my own kids who are teenagers, that nobody would show up. So based on who you want to come and who you want to deal with, you have to engage with those particular people. Uh, so the idea is uh, to, to have 
uh, disperse the power and the resources in the hands of the community to figure out the place, to collaborate on the kinds of programs that occur, to for those programs to build people's capacity and make sure people are compensated for it. I think that that closes the loop and allows whatever occurs to occur. So I, I wish there was like a cookie cutter one. And you say cha-cha slide, we say electric slide, you know, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, but thing. you know what I'm saying? But but the idea that that it's it's organic and evolves as what we think of as joy uh, evolves, that there's a mechanism in there that allows uh, the community to define that for themselves. Right. Yeah. Okay, so Tabitha? Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I was just gonna say, I think that for me, it's about a process that helps community to fully embrace that the process that they are engaged in isn't about them coming up with new and shiny. There's something culturally, and I and I don't want to overreach into other cultures, but you know, within black communities, and I've seen it in other sometimes ethnic communities, which is really beautiful, is this uh, blending of generations and such a deep respect for sometimes the smallest things, even music. So, you know, whether it be like, sometimes I'm surprised where people who are maybe what feels to be, you know, a, a generation behind me or more um, know who Jodeci is, or back in the day we would call Jodeci, or they, you know, Frankie Beverly featuring Mays come on and everybody's snapping their fingers and, and it doesn't really matter the age. And I, I think that there is something powerful and humbling about how we see a corner really sometimes what me comes up for me seeing maybe men gathering and laughing and joking in place seems like they are in the right place and not out of place and or how I would imagine what is possible and permissible in a park sometimes that's off brand and I just think that the truth of it is the part of the hard work I think in collective society is really making room for all permutations of what loving and living loud looks like and loving life and what joy looks like and what success looks like. Um, and that I think is difficult to do sometimes in the context of processes that are typically really still um, heavily influenced by the, a dominant culture or a lot of times, you know, although the European or white narrative in this country a lot, are a lot of sometimes the predominant architects or the developers. And so I would honestly argue on in that case and perhaps on their behalf, I don't know if it's always intentional, but it's what they know, which then makes it really hard when you don't have the resources um, of your own to truly develop and insert yourself into the process in a way that will be heard and that will influence the outcome. And so it's not that anyone I think ever has to become an expert in someone else's history and truth and culture. But I think that that is something to say about being more willing that the designs that you come up with, the, the processes that you create, that there's always probably 30 to 20 to 30 percent room, if not more, for you to be influenced and that you, you go to the meeting being excited to leave with a different plan. I've typically not been a part of many community engagement processes when community really starts talking about the things that they want to do when they are clear on what's possible. So they've been given the mandate that you can do these things within this realm. So it's not the pie in the sky, let's put them all in the middle of the park. It's things that they've been given the belief that they could actually influence and still the consternation and the, by the urban the, the planners of what oh and the him and the hind and then the just looks to be for them the indictment on their work as opposed to being excited to co-create and i don't know if you can kind of teach how to become excited to co-create because the truth of it is we supposedly do it every day because we are co-living we are cohabitating in each other's space but we have, again, this tricky behavior of pretending that one person's way of living and inhabiting this space is the only way to inhabit this space. And that's a muscle that I hope that we can encourage, influence others and including ourselves to work on. So th that's a whole nother 
conversation about designers and co-creation <laughs> okay. um, that we do not have time for tonight. Sorry, <laughs> that, that, Sorry, that's okay. Paul. You know, my 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 mantra to 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 the, to this all the time with designers is okay. You know, check your ego at the door when you come to the community meeting because right, if we're going to co-create, you know, you have to leave your. I already I already think I know. So we're going to have to wrap up because we, we've got some questions. So I want to end, you know, and um, I want to talk talk a little bit about sustainability and hope. So we're going to end on a high note. Um, so, I mean, Tabitha, both you and, and Kobe have touched on it, you know, about, you know, um, ownership, uh, you know, Tabitha, you, you, you talked about, you know, history and communities, you know, this idea of sustainability, which goes beyond, which goes beyond just, you know, the land, you know, like there's more to sustainability than I think sometimes what we talk about even the environmental side. So I, I really want you know, you talk a little bit about how do we sustain like, you know, as you said, Tabitha, I don't need another, um, I don't need another documentary. Right. And, and the urgency of now, which I, you know, I don't want to wake up, you know, eight months from eight months from now and go, OK, you know, that's over. Um, um, so so how do we how do we sustain this in a way that it's that it's grounded? It's you know, it's it's real, you know, and it's it's evolving and people, you know, feel heard and we're co-creating. Uh, and then, you know, since I know I don't got a lot of time, then we'll get to hope. Um, you know, because as we know, and like Mary Frances Winter said in her book, you know, black fatigue is real. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, what is always great for me when I have these conversations with folks like you is, you know, gives me hope, you know, you know, that I'm, I'm, you know, I see I'm out here, I'm, you know, I'm not alone, you know, we're all in this together. And so if you two could kind of comment too on how, you know, how you, you know, how should, what should we do, how you keep going and, you know, how we can continue this. And so then we'll go to question Q&A. I know that's a lot, but you know. It was, it I was. Know. I'm gonna try to keep my comments brief. I think that I would encourage everybody, including myself as a personal affirmation to have hope in what you're willing to do and not what somebody else should do. Um, when you know what you are able to change and understand that those are muscles that you need to develop, there's something likely that you can do in your life, so an issue that you can be focused on um, more deeply to enrich how we interact with the, each other in this world. And it's then not about us fixing this one thing or doing it all at once. And so that's what I would start in terms of something practical and tactical that individuals listening could leave with is be sometimes less agitated, anxious about what somebody ain't doing and be more curious and committed to what you're willing to do. I think that that then helps me to know that I don't always have to believe that I'm going to see our community, our world, our country get a W when it comes to race relations in these here United States. Um, I am not overwhelmed by that. I think it's about sometimes really looking at where a W could happen and funding the hell out of it. Right now for me where I think a W could happen is at the corner of 38th and Chicago at George Floyd Square. We should already have $100 million in the bank to fund whatever memorial or museum or a justice and healing center that would be a wraparound to that community right now. We could do that. We could get a W right now if we decided that over a year ago, just over a year ago, that we shook the world with an eight minute and 46 second video. We could decide that our response right now is not to go in and to determine what the community does, but just to give the community the money to do whatever the hell it wants to do. So it's not then about everybody needing to be on the same page about what the loss of his life, the heinous murder of his life is, but it is about get out of the way and understand that there will not always be everybody who gets to the other side at the same time. We don't all need to reach the promised land together, but we need to let some people reach it. Okay. That's fantastic. It was. You know, I think uh, a parallel, and I know Minneapolis is a reimagined civic commons city, so is Memphis. And there was an announcement today uh, that in Tom Lee Park, uh, the Mellon Foundation just gave a million dollars uh, from Theasta Gates to create a new monument to listening, is what it's called, mm -hmm. uh, in the place where the statue and the remains of Nathan Pfeffer Forrest were interred. 
So the long story of this particular park is, yes, the founder of the KKK and his wife were interred in a riverfront park in Memphis. And it took continuous community action and resistance to make that happen. They were able to attract uh, the interest of multiple foundations for that patience, right? That long period of time to allow the community to deliberate, to determine a direction, to apply pressure and support where necessary. And now the park has been renamed, the remains removed, and now a new dedication of a new monument that indicates where the community is today, reflective of that process of healing. So I think it is possible. I think there is reason for hope. I also think that there are just some decision-making things uh, that we need to reflect on, how we make decisions. So we talked a little bit about equity before, but these notions of structural equity, like uh, whatever we're working on, uh, are we addressing historic advantages and disadvantages? Advantages as well. We usually think about the disadvantages, but some people profited and benefited from disadvantaged uh, communities and others, and they need to be uh, uh, discussed as well. A procedural equity, as we deal with engagement and planning, are we doing our best to make sure that the people that were most affected are at the head of the table? And are we prepared to cede power and resources to them uh, to make those particular decisions? That's something we have to start asking ourselves. Distributional equity, we know that there's an equitable distribution for parks, open space, and infrastructure. Are we willing to look at that from the standpoint of advantages and disadvantages and bring balance uh, to the communities that have not uh, had the benefit of those resources? And because this is life work, uh, transgenerational uh, equity, right? Is what we're doing building wealth and health in the communities that were most disenfranchised by the harm done by intentional decisions from the past. And I think that if we start to think about that as an active part of our decision making on almost every policy, not just ones dedicated to the places we're talking about today, but all of them, uh, then we will start to form the habit of thinking about it in a different kind of way. Oh, all right, Tabitha and Kofi, um, thank you, you know, for an incredible conversation. I wish we had more time, but we have some more. We have some questions, so we're gonna we're gonna get to those. Um, starting with talking about um, um, land, um, a question about vacant land, like adjacent to a BIPOC community, how would we, how would we think about um, designing um, this space where people truly feel free and liberated? Um, like what, which is a big question, but. I think that was for you, Kofi. It is for you. <laughs> <laughs> As I play support moderator. For <laughs> well, as an outsider, um, all I can do is talk about uh, practices and ways we've approached it in other places. And what I would say is, well, first of all, does the community actually want to park or open space? It's because we think it's a good opportunity. And if they do, how do we uh, build their capacity and their capabilities to lead the process? Defining uh, perceptions of it, historical connections, uh, technical consultants and other people can support and provide information and help inform decision-making. But I think that they need to lead that particular process. Uh, the professional ASLA awards uh, just came out recently. There's an excellent precedent in California uh, that uh, may provide a, a guideway to get there. I'll be able to share that later with the group. But I think it's, you know, that, that notion of patience, that notion of not empowerment, but leadership, right? Investment in leadership so that the community leads the process all the way through. I think that there are able technical consultants from anywhere who know how to do the technical implementation of what that what happens but in terms of being there at, at, at the beginning of it to frame and shape it and accountability on the way it has to be led by the community i just right, want to well, double down you. amen and diddle that True. all right every single aspect because i think that that centers people and i think the hard part i just want to speak to what becomes difficult in practice is that what kofi just described what my brother just described is completely upending where we typically center process which is on return, speed, right? And, <laughs> and a homogeny, yep. right? And mm -hmm. so when you're not bound, 
by the things that you believe you so know that this group needs, or that's just a part of your plan that's then going to lead to economic, you know, uh, resources for the municipality and then the fake, it's gonna lead to income in the community too, but we know that don't always play out the way that it's sold to people who live in the community type of thing. The thing about what we sometimes have to ask ourselves, are we bold enough to be different? Because mm. we have over indexed on how we currently operate. Mm -hmm. It would not necessarily cost us a lot if we permitted our processes and procedures and our systems to be 20% different than who we are. We don't want to give an inch. Mm. But I promise you, we would make the world of difference if we allow some of the stuff we do that has not served most people in this country well to mm. change to have an awakening, to be mm -hmm. to be a part of a transformation. And that's just me encouraging, again, everyone to think about what role do you play blocking progress? When you get agitated, when people start talking about difference, do your hands start sweating? Do you, your back <laughs> start sweating? <laughs> 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 you know so too, that's a little too much information. That's, that's TMI right there. That's TMI. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right Tabitha, come Go on. To the next question. All right, to the, de to the next question. Um, well, since we're talking about rivers and riverfronts, there's a question here about Upper Harbor. And so the question is, how would you view the way plans for the Upper Harbor Terminal have involved as an example of how open space development should or should not take place in response to predominantly Black communities' concerns for place? Well, and since Kofi, you don't know anything about Upper Harbor, you can't answer that, that question. And since uh, I'm, I'm deep in the deep, have been deep in Upper Harbor, you know, my response to that, though, does build on a lot of what Kofi and Tabitha just talked about. I mean, I think the reality is, um, how does the community see that place? How do we talk about the layers that are on that land? Not just, not just the Black community, but the Indigenous community. How do we think about those layers? Um, and how does that translate as we go through a process, as, as you just said, Tabitha, where we have time, which is 20% different, which is not homogenous, to mm -hmm. get to a development um, that community says, okay, um, not okay, but that community is like, it drove it. And that goes back to the co-creation. Yeah. So that's my way of saying, and, you know, I still believe that that's possible um, at Upper Harbor um, because I'm a preacher's okay. son. So, <laughs> so, is that right? so, so faith, you never yeah. give up. Oh, yeah, so, so, you, you so, you know, so faith is, faith is endemic, you, you know. Mr. Kofi, he about to go swing low on us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just. <laughs> All right, we got, we got to wrap up soon. So go ahead, Tabo. <laughs> okay, seriously, seriously. I think that one of the things that makes Upper Harbor difficult is because now you see that we're trying to retrofit our mistakes by not centering people in voice first. And so now it's like being in a bad relationship where, at the, you know, the second date, they showed a sign, or maybe they start yelling at the waiter and the waitress, and then they tried to convince you in the car it wasn't going to happen again. And you kind of kind of side eyeing the whole time, like, listen, I don't know if you wrap too tight. This is sometimes what happens then in community when they feel like the first steps didn't go well. Now they have a raised eyebrow on the entire rest of the engagements. And it's all I say that to say is it's difficult to come back from in terms of trust once it feels like it was never important in the first place, right? Once it felt like it wasn't important to be in a healthy relationship in the first place. So I don't necessarily know what's gonna be the outcome, but I think that right now it seems like it's still gonna be wrapped in a lot of questions for people in terms of the approach, the intentionality and who will it benefit. So the only the other question was, and Tabitha, that you really answered it is someone was asking, was there a plan or was M, um, Parks on Dungeon working on parks around George Floyd Square? And you pretty much answered that earlier to say, you know, you know, about the hundred million dollars. So yep. um, with that, I'm going to wrap up. And again, Tabitha and Kofi, thank you very much. Uh, it was wonderful. And shout out to the Block Knight family who's watching from the East Coast. Love you all. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful conversation, Kofi, Tabitha, Paul. Um, I can't thank you enough. I think this is the conversation we need to keep having. And Tabitha, I think you're absolutely right. This is not just about a conversation. Uh, we need to do the work, money where the mouth is. 
uh, and uh, the Parks Foundation, we're, we're here to try to do some of that. Um, to all of you who have joined us, thank you so much for spending an hour with us here online. I know the world is a lot of screen stuff, but um, these are important uh, topics and it's important and we really appreciate all of you joining us, the notes that we see, uh, the comments, um, keep engaged. Um, we will continue to have this. This is the first of our series uh, for the 2021-2022 season. Um, we have a couple more coming up, one in February, February 5th, uh, with winter camping, and uh, that's with Ambreen Tariq. And then we have one uh, that's in coordination with the Great Northern Festival. Uh, and then we also have one with uh, Mike Young Kim in uh, April. And uh, look to our website, www dot mplsparksfoundation.org for more of that. Tabitha, if you're still on, you want to give me a quick, uh, the, uh, your website address so folks can see some of your work? Of course. Thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. www.p as in Paul, p as in Paul, n as in Nancy, a as in apple, dot org, ppna.org. Great. Uh, you're doing great work. Your your association in that neighborhood has um, been in the middle of some of the most important conversations on the planet right now. And thank you for that work uh, and your joy and your, your call to question. Kofi, do you have anything you want to direct people to as well with your work? Uh, any, any website folks can go to learn more that you want to add in? Nope. If you all just Google my name and NC State, it'll all come up. So, And I do want to mention what Black, Life, Black Landscapes Matter Came from Walter Hood, who's yes. my good friend and brother, his book and the chapter there. So please support Walter's book. It's a great book. Um, yes. I, I, so please do look that book up. It's uh, it is it takes this conversation and then some. So posters for parks is happening uh, online this year on October 23rd is the uh, pre-sale. So artists in Minneapolis are creating posters right now that are on sale. Those those funds will go to support the artists. They also go to support the People for Parks Fund, which are then given to the community for really great activation. Please join us. You can go to our website for that. Oh, I want to thank our 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 sponsor again, Bar Engineering. Thank you to all of our donors, staff, board, community members. This conversation, our RCC, Reimagining Civic Commons partners in uh, across the country. Thank you for joining us. Um, and then for those in Minneapolis who are voting, uh, you can go through our website, League of Women Voters. We do have a list of the candidates, uh, a survey that that most all provided. Um, go out there and 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 and. The park board in Minneapolis is really important to delivering the park system we want. We'll keep working with them as, as well. But just, you know, we, the more people who vote, the more they pay attention, the more work we do. Um, once again, Kofi, Tabitha, Paul, thank you so much. So grateful to have you uh, as part of this. Um, we look forward to carrying on the conversation. And we hope to see you all again. Give us feedback uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see you again soon. So with that, I think we're in for the night. Appreciate it. We'll see you in the parks. <laughs>